everyone, and welcome to another episode of Your Health in Your Hands. I'm Dr. David Ajibade with the Brain and Body Foundation. Now, one of our goals with this whole teaching and these uh, this, this this series, especially during this COVID-19 time, is to help you, the layperson, understand how to better take control of your health and avoid um, getting sick. But even if you do get sick, you know you should know what to do. And of course, you can't do anything without the help. Well, and let, me take, let me take that back. There's something you need to do for yourself, which is, in this case, building your immune system, uh, wearing your masks, and doing all the, all the other things that the CDC, uh, the NCDC advises you to do. There's also the government's responsibility and the healthcare professional's responsibility, especially if you do get a more severe case of the virus. And therefore, you need to know what questions to ask and you need to know when to go to the doctor. You don't want to be a hero. You want to make sure that you go for, you seek medical attention as quickly as possible. And there are lots of ins and outs of, of those things, but it's really important, most important that you know what to do and are fully equipped so that when the virus, when you do get the virus, and remember I didn't say if, because pretty much everybody's going to get in contact with the virus. You just want to be one of the statistics that's uh, that's uh, in the winning side and not on the losing side. And so that's why we're doing all these episodes to edu educate you, to inform you, to empower you. And I'm particularly happy about today because I have a very close, close and old, older friend <laughs> who was actually my roommate in medical school and who eventually got into uh, infectious diseases and he's out based in the United States. So without further ado, I'm going to say welcome to the show, Dr. Shegun Nimisi. Thank you very much, Dr. Ajibadi. It's okay. Nice ah. Privilege of being on your show. We're glad you could make it. I know it hasn't been easy. You've been extremely busy, especially during this COVID-19 time. But um, we are proud of what you're doing. And just tell us a little bit about your story and how you got, got to be in this stage. Because I remember when we were, we were roommates I was in medical school, it was always about orthopedic surgery. And so now you're in ID, infectious disease. How did that happen? Okay, thank you very much for the question. So I finished medical school, like you said, University of Ibadan. Hey, great job. also at University of Ibadan. And after that, I did national youth service in Plateau State. And then I moved back to Lagos. I was in private practice for about a year. And that was an opening to go to National Orthopedic Hospital in Bobby, and I went there to study orthopedic surgery. At that time, I had a thought about going abroad to further my studies, and I had a discussion with one of my friends, Dr. Adelaide, and we thought it would be nice for us to study health finance and management or health policy and management. And so that's how our interest in studying abroad uh, came about. And so I applied to various colleges in the United States and I got admission to Johns Hopkins and I proceeded there to do a master's in health finance and management. So that sort of opened my eyes to other possibilities within the healthcare system. And so I took my licensing exams in the United States. And at that time, I made a decision that I wanted to do infectious diseases. And the reason is because, sorry? Yeah, you okay, you're about to tell me why. So that's because I find it very, very interesting. I find it very, very fascinating. One of my, my favorite TV shows are the ones that involve investigating various things, whether it's, um, you know, spy movies or whether it's um, infections or whether it's crime. So I found it very, very challenging. I found it very, very, you know, um, exciting because it's not an easy specialty. It involves looking for clues so that you can make a diagnosis and treat the patient appropriately. So I, I found it thrilling doing that. And that's why I went into infectious disease. Interesting. And where did you do your residency? So I did my residency at one of the Cleveland Clinic community hospitals called Huron Hospital in East Cleveland. And um, I pursued a fellowship at Harlem Hospital in New York in infectious diseases. 
Okay, nice. And currently, you are? So right now, I am an infectious disease physician in the community hospital in Northeast Ohio. It's in Lake County, which is near Cleveland. I think Cleveland, Ohio is a place that people are probably more familiar with. And uh, I'm an attending physician there. So part of my duty is, is to evaluate patients and formulate a management uh, plan. Also, I'm also the chairman of medicine in uh, my community hospital. And part of that is an administrative responsibility to oversee um, the department and all the physicians in that department. Also, um, the chairman of infection control committee in another community hospital, which is a university hospital in Geauga. It's about 20, 30 minutes from downtown Cleveland. And so I provide guidance when it comes to infectious disease uh, management, infection control. There. And finally, in another community hospital, I'm the chairman of the antimicrobial stewardship committee just ensuring that we give the right antibiotic for the right condition at the right dose, right duration, so that we can reduce the spread of resistant organisms in our patients. So I wear quite a lot of hats. Wow. Where do you find time to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say sleep. What is that? What does sleep mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, that's fantastic. That is a lot of work you're doing. So uh, well, kudos to you. Um, so after this break, we're going to come back. But a question that's, that's, that's lingering in my mind is how has, one, how has COVID-19 changed your practice? And uh, what are the lessons we've learned in the past one year from dealing with COVID-19? And um, also want to know about why, what's so special about COVID-19. This isn't the first pandemic. There have been other epidemics and pandemics in the past. What's so special about COVID-19? So just, folks, just hold on. We'll, we will be right back. Welcome back, folks. I am here with Dr. Shego uh, who is an infectious disease specialist working in about three different hospitals. I don't know how he does it. But anyway, uh, that's interesting. So one of the questions that keep on coming up, Dr. Gulesi, is this. How is it, when we've had pandemics in the past, uh, we've had epidemics, what, and we have all kinds of disease-causing micro, microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, worms, and so on and so forth. What is it about viruses in particular that make them take the headlines for, <laughs> for lack of a better term. All right, thank you. That's, that's a very, very great question. So yeah. when it comes to microorganisms, different microorganisms have different properties. And those properties affect the way they infect human beings and the way they present clinically. So there are different ways things can be transmitted. One of the ways is through contact. Another way is through what we call droplet. So when it comes to coronavirus 19 or COVID-19, one of the things that happened was through mutation, it had the ability to become more contagious. Now there are many, there are, there are seven types of coronaviruses in human beings. So the first four are the ones that we are used to. At least half of us have been infected by the first four types of coronavirus. And they tend to cause mild illnesses such as, you know, runny nose and um, mainly runny nose, things that we don't really pay much attention to. But in 2002, 2003, there was a major mutation among the, coronavi among the coronaviruses. And that was what, for the first time, caused a severe acute respiratory syndrome. What that means is, instead of just having something causing a runny nose, you now have an infection that involves the lung. So infections, the runny nose is a mild infection. You can use this as a congestion. But when something starts to affect the lungs, it starts to affect people's ability to breathe and ability you know, to, to function because the lung is one of our vital organs. 
So that happened in 2002, 2003. And that was the result of a mutation. A mutation can allow a virus to become more contagious. So we've had about variants in South Africa, Nigeria breeding. What happens with those variants is that even as contagious as the coronavirus has been, this has given it the ability to become more contagious. So how do people get the coronavirus? Through contact, touching a surface, and then touching the face, eyes, or the nose. Or when you when someone sneezes, and if you are within six feet of that person, then you can get the coronavirus. Now, there are other viruses that exist, but they're not as contagious because they don't have those properties. Mutations give you abilities that other people who are not mutants don't have. So, it's, so that, that, that's the issue with the coronavirus. And so 2002, 2003, we had the first coronavirus. It was deadly in the sense that probably about 10% of people that had it died of it, but it wasn't highly contagious as this one. So what happened was it stayed mainly within the healthcare system and sort of fizzled out because of all the infection control practices and so on and so forth. Then in 2013, 2014, we had the sixth coronavirus, which moved from humans to, from camels to humans, Saudi Arabia, Kenya, other countries that have that. And what happened was that also had a higher mortality rate, but it wasn't as contagious. Viruses tend to give up, give up one. It's either you kill or you're contagious. The worst case scenario is when you are as contagious as you kill. So the coronavirus we're talking about, the mortality rate or the death rate is probably about maybe half to 1%. That's what we think. We time we might find that it might be lower, it might be higher. But this virus has become more contagious. That is the ability to spread from person to person. For you to have a pandemic, you must have an ability to spread from person to person that is beyond the norm, the other types of viruses. So what we found out in the United States is that this is a flu season. In my state of Ohio, we barely have 100 cases of the flu, but we're still having, at this time when things are getting better, we have up, we have up to 1,000 cases of the coronavirus in one day. We have our masking and social distancing is making the flu almost non-existent but it's not strong enough, or it doesn't go far enough to prevent the transmission of coronavirus from person to person. So the viruses have those abilities through mutation to, to transmit from person to person in a way that they wouldn't have without that mutation. So that, that's, that, that's interesting. That's interesting. So basically you're saying that people are not having the flu, and this brings another May, may touch on it in conspiracy theory, and that people are saying that, oh, well, every, everybody, everything is switching to coronavirus now. People are not having flu anymore. They're not having cancer anymore. They're not having heart disease anymore. It's being changed to uh, to read coronavirus instead of instead of flu. But what you are saying, you just said just now, that the flu, the masks and social distancing are effective against the regular flu, but not effective against the coronavirus. Yeah, not as effective against the coronavirus as against the flu. So when, at this time, because it is flu season, whenever we want to test someone for the coronavirus, we test them from actually three viruses. The coronavirus, the influenza virus, and another virus that tends to occur in kids called RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. So we do all the three in one. So we're not just testing against the coronavirus simply because we're in flu season. I want to make sure that we, because if someone is negative for the coronavirus and positive for the flu, we can still die of the flu. I want to make sure that we treat the person who has the flu as, a, as appropriate. So we're not just focused on the coronavirus. We're actually testing for all three because of this flu season at this time. I see. Yeah. I see. Wow, a thousand cases. That is, that is serious. These are confirmed cases. What 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 percentage of that eventually goes into the ICU? Do you know? Well, it, most of the time, people that have the flu do not end up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. They end up in the primary care doctor's office or what we call urgent care centers where you treat minor illnesses. Because most of the time, the flu can be managed conservatively. That is by taking 
medication, it has Tylenol, cough. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah, I'm not talking about the flu now. I'm talking about coronavirus. Okay. Is that what so, you're talking about? Yeah. So the coronavirus, the number of cases have dropped because if we if we the, the deadly the most difficult time was November and December, when you had up to 10,000 cases a day in the state of Ohio. Wow. So now it's dropped to about a thousand. And um part of the reason why is because, well, we believe the reason why is because. We're having more people getting the vaccines on a daily basis than we're diagnosing uh, people with coronavirus. And some of the vaccines have reduced the ability to transmit the virus from person to person. And some of the vaccines have made, made, made the, if, if they get the virus, they tend not to be as sick as if they haven't got the vaccine. So the, the, the overall strategy, because there are two ways to deal with this kind of virus. One, let it go through the whole population. But then that's in the United States, you have about 350, 360 million people at a 0.5% rate. You're talking about millions of people, over a million people. Now, that's one way to do it. But also the problem with that is we, we can't stomach that number of deaths. And number two is it overwhelms the hospital system. Some people that have coronavirus can stay up more than a month in the hospital before they get better. So the other way to do that is how do you get the population immune to the coronavirus without getting infected? With it? And that's the reason why the vaccine is a strategy to get people immune so that even if they get infected down the stretch, then they have to have mild symptoms and they don't overwhelm the healthcare system. That makes sense. All right, we're going to take a quick break now, folks. Don't go away. All right, welcome back, folks. We are talking about COVID-19 with Dr. Shagun Glesi. Doc, let's talk about vaccines because that's uh, some people's minds now and Nigeria is soon going to start distributing vaccines. I think about 4 million, last count. A lot of people are saying uh, it's, 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 it's a prank. It's, uh, it's going to cause, they're going to put chips in our bodies. We're going to program us into zombies. Please tell us about it. Okay, so vaccines are not new. They are things that have been used to deal with infectious diseases in the past. As you very well know, in the past, we've had problems with smallpox, and that has been eradicated with vaccines. We also had vaccines, oral polio vaccines, and I believe that Nigeria has eradicated oral polio. So vaccine programs in Nigeria are things that have been done successfully in the past. Now, when it comes to COVID-19, I can understand why people may be hesitant about vaccines, because Part of what they hear is it's a new formula and we're not really sure about it. Yeah. So the COVID vaccines that have been approved, I'll talk about the Moderna, the Pfizer, the Johnson & Johnson. These are vaccines that use what is called messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is a molecule that is sent from the gene, the DNA, that codes for a specific kind of protein codes for your eyes, codes for your skin, and so on and so forth. Now, messenger RNA technology is not new. It's something that has been worked on for probably over 30 years now. And the, but it hasn't been deployed in the area of vaccine. And that's because the need hadn't arisen. They tried to use it for other things like sickle cell and cancer. So that, that, that technology is over 30 years old. The technology putting it in what it called nanoparticles, which is like a fat covering, is something that is not new also. This was finalized around 2014. So it's something that has been used in the past for various things, such as, like I mentioned, sickle cell and so on and so forth. But when the COVID-19 pandemic came, they thought we could use this when it comes to the virus. The purpose of the vaccine is to send a message to your body to produce something called a spike protein. When you look at the coronavirus, you see what appears to be spikes on the surface. And that spike protein is so important because that's what it uses to open up the cell and infect the cell. So when it comes into my arm, what it does is my arm's immune system will pick it up and swallow it up and process it. That mRNA is going to last for a few minutes. But before it la but before those few minutes uh, uh, um, pass, it sends a message to my body to produce a particular kind of protein called the spike protein. 
when that protein is produced, my immune system will say, this is, this is new, and produces an antibody, which is an immune response to that, and that gives protection up to 94, 95% against the COVID vaccine, against the COVID vaccine. For how long? So, For how long? How long? How, how, long is that? how long that is because the studies were done middle to late last year. So until we test people this year, we can't really give a definite answer. But okay. we've got very, very good results. We, we, the side effects are minimal for most people. Some people may have some adverse effects, but from my experience talking to my colleagues, my siblings who have gotten the vaccine, within 48 hours, those, those symptoms resolve. So it's a okay. vaccine that has been very, very well tolerated. Two of my siblings have done it, and my mom has gotten one dose of the vaccine. So I'm very, very comfortable with the vaccine. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for for, for, for our laying up fears. Um, as we always say, people should ask questions. They should investigate for themselves and um, should be um, ask questions, basically. Just the, um, people are always saying, oh, that's, that's absolute. There's going to cause all kinds of problems here and there. But in the final analysis, you, you do need to ask questions and be convinced for yourself. So thank you, Dr. Gulesi. I think our time is up. Do you have any final, final quest, uh, and tips uh, for our people in Nigeria? Well, what I'd like to say is that Nigeria is a great country, it has great people. The COVID vaccine cannot take us down. Let's work together to deal with the vaccine and to deal with the virus. Less mask, less social distance, and let's consider getting the vaccine so that we can get our economy back on track and our people safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Well said, Doc. And folks, also remember, you need to strengthen your immune system. Vitamin D, vitamin C, and of course, zinc. These are safe things that can be used to boost your immune system, in addition to everything else that is out there that is available for you guys, as Dr. Pulesi has said. Till then, remember to stay safe, stay strong, and uh, you can watch our videos on our website and on NTS website. So see you next week. God bless. Bye.